So good morning and welcome to this uh, webinar about the causes and determinants of Parkinson's disease. Um, my name is Alan Cameron. I'm part of the uh, East of England Research Interest Group, which is itself part of the Parkinson's UK Research Support Network. Um, if we could move on to the next slide, please. Um, it's worth saying that although we will be, the subject of this call is something to do with healthcare, and nothing in this video is meant as health advice. Um, you should always consult a doctor before uh, taking any action um, in, in this kind of thing. Uh, if it, if you have questions from any after the, the call or anything you're concerned about, the Parkinson's UK helpline is, is there um, and the number is given at the bottom of the screen. So um, if we go on to the next slide, it's my happy task to introduce the speaker for today, which is Dr. Alistair Noyce, who is pretty well known around Parkinson's UK. He's currently a reader in neurology and neuroepidemiology in preventative neuro neurology unit at uh, Queen Mary University of London. He's a consultant neurologist and a researcher, and as I said, um, well known to Parkinson's UK over many years, he's uh, presented at conferences and and the like um, as a very good speaker. Uh, so with without further ado, I'll hand you over to Alistair to talk about the causes and determinants of Parkinson's disease. Thank you very much, Alan, for that nice introduction. I'm going to just try and share my screen. And tell me does that seem to be looking right to you yep that's spot on yes yeah okay excellent i'm just going to move this around so I... perfect okay so good morning everyone my name's alistair noyce i had a very nice introduction i'm going to be talking about the causes and determinants or epidemiology of parkinson's disease let me move this forward so you know, historically, if I gave a talk on the epidemiology of Parkinson's, I would actually define epidemiology, uh, first of all. Um, but given the year that we've just had, I probably don't need to tell you what epidemiologists uh, do. Uh, we study the uh, we study and analyze the distribution, uh, the who, when and where, uh, the patterns, the determinants of health and disease uh, in defined uh, populations. Um, and epidemiology is the cornerstone of public health and preventive medicine. But of course, we are all painfully aware of this fact um, over 2020 and 2021 because of the coronavirus uh, pandemic. So actually, we've all become armchair, literally armchair, because we're confined to the house, uh, armchair epidemiologists um, who are used to looking at these curves of daily new cases, um, uh, daily deaths, uh, sadly, and these distributions uh, over time. And we're also used to the interventions that epidemiology um, recommends to us, face masks, physical distancing, uh, hand washing, vaccination. So epidemiology is now uh, really a household term. What will we cover in this talk? Well, we're going to talk about the increasing burden of Parkinson's disease, environment, and lifestyle factors, and then a little bit about what I would call extended epidemiology. So the genetics of Parkinson's, gene environment interactions, and causal inference. And that's the slightly heavier part of the talk and which will come to in due course. And finally, I'll finish with what I'm calling epidemiology in action, which is a Predict PD a study, which I hope many of you have, have heard of. So coronavirus is not the only global pandemic. Um, the burden of Parkinson's disease is rising uh, dramatically around the world. Um, this paper from Ray Dorsey and Baz Bloom summarised data uh, from the Global uh, Burden of Disease Study, this paper, I should say, over on the left panel here, and showed that actually over the next uh, 25 years, we expect uh, the overall burden of Parkinson's to double from about 6 million uh, to uh, 12 or 13 million. And here in the right side of the screen, is the Global Burden of Disease paper for Parkinson's disease showing the, uh, the prevalence or the caseload of Parkinson's by country around the world. But I used a word there, prevalence, which may be uh, unfamiliar to some. 
And these terms, prevalence and incidence, have been thrown around, um, particularly in the context of the uh, coronavirus pandemic, and get thrown around a lot in any epidemiological talk. Um, and they're often conflated together incorrectly, so I want to just um, define them for the sake of clarity. The prevalence refers to the proportion of cases in a population at a given point in time. It's the percentage of people in a population that have Parkinson's disease. Whereas the incidence is the number of new cases that occur in a susceptible population over a given time period. Okay, and they're quite distinct and they can be illustrated, these two concepts, with the epidemiologist bathtub. Okay, if prevalence refers to the overall uh, burden of a disease in society, the overall number of the overall percentage of people with Parkinson's in a population, then the only way that that can change is if you add new cases to that incidence, or if people unfortunately die, and therefore, uh, if incidents and uh, deaths are consistent, then the prevalence will remain the same. So distinct, um, but related uh, concepts. A quick summary of the epidemiology of Parkinson's before we, we drill further in. So for every two uh, women with Parkinson's, there are three men. It's more common in men. And the prevalence, this is the proportion of a population that has Parkinson's, increases with age. So in the general population, the prevalence is less than a percent, it's 0.2%. But when you move to the over 60s age group, the prevalence is more like 1% to 2%. What are the risk factors for Parkinson's? Well, we know that a, that a family history, apologies for the typo there, a family history is, uh, is present in approximately uh, 10 to 15 uh, percent of cases, um, that environmental factors may be important. I'm going to talk about pesticides and, and metals, um, that diet and metabolism may be important, and that certain uh, traumatic events through life can uh, predispose to Parkinson's. I summarised the early features and risk factors for Parkinson's with this schematic. So along the horizontal uh, axis, and, and anyone that's been to one of my talks before, I often uh, use this schematic. So in the, uh, on the horizontal axis, you have things over on this side, which are associated with a decreased risk of Parkinson's, moving to a moderate increased risk of Parkinson's, and then a marked increased risk of Parkinson's. And on the vertical axis, you can see the frequency of these things in the population or the prevalence of these things in the population. And we group these uh, using colors into things that are environmental risk factors. So some things in the environment that are associated or, or uh, environmental exposures that are associated with the reduced risk of Parkinson's, some things here in orange that are associated with an increased risk. And then the things in green, I would label these as early features of Parkinson's as opposed to risk factors, things that occur prior to diagnosis of Parkinson's like constipation, anxiety and depression, smell loss or anosmia, and a certain type of sleep disorder called RBD. And then in red, we've got some of the more important uh, genetic uh, risk factors for Parkinson's disease. So what, what is epidemiology? Well, epidemiology is a range uh, of investigations and one of the um, neatest bits of epidemiology relative to Parkinson's came from some serious detective work undertaken in the 80s by uh, Bill Langston in California, where a group of patients presented to San Francisco hospitals overnight with onset of Parkinsonism, not Parkinson's disease, but Parkinsonism. And it transpired that all of these people were heroin users and that they had been exposed to the same batch of heroin that had been cut with an impurity, which later was revealed to be a chemical called MPTP. Now, MPTP can cross from the bloodstream across the blood brain barrier into the uh, cells of the brain, the astrocytes, where it's converted to another chemical called MPP. And MPP binds to dopamine transporters and then moves into dopaminergic brain cells where it affects the mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cells, and causes damage to dopaminergic neurons and dopaminergic uh, neuron death and um, the symptoms of Parkinson's. Um, it's not Parkinson's disease, but it's a neat model for how Parkinsonism could occur in this uh, small cluster of cases. And this figure was actually drawn by one of my uh, students, Theodora Hill. So this was a very elegant piece of epidemiology and detective work. 
um, that found a, a chemical that can give us the appearance of Parkinson's disease. If we switch gears and think about now, instead of case studies in case series, very large uh, population-based studies, we know that farming, agricultural occupations, rural living, well water drinking are all associated with PD in very large uh, studies. But pesticides are a varied group of chemicals. Um, measuring exposure to them is challenging, but exposure could occur through ingestion, uh, either food or water or occupational exposure. But interestingly, one of the biggest culprits within uh, the pesticide uh, group is a drug called Paraquat, which is structurally very similar to MPP, which is that compound that I mentioned in the previous slide uh, that is the metabolite of MPTP and was associated with Parkinsonism in the cluster of heroin users in uh, California. So here you see this very nice uh, analogy and link between toxic exposures on a very, on a very small scale and a very large scale uh, linking paraquat and this compound MPP uh, to Parkinsonism. Paraquat as a pesticide has actually been banned in the UK and the European Union for well over a decade, but is still being produced in the UK by a company called Syngenta just outside of Huddersfield. Uh, but although we don't use it uh, in the UK, we export lots of it to uh, the United States uh, and to the Americas, uh, Central and South America, and also to Asia. And so this may be very relevant when we're thinking about the global burden of Parkinson's disease. Back to a schematic. So on this schematic, what we're showing is that um, on average, if pesticide exposure increases, risk of, um, um, risk of Parkinson's disease increases by this line. So along this line, you've got increasing pesticide exposure and a modest increase in risk of Parkinson's disease. But that's unlikely to be the full story. It's not simply the case that if you were exposed a lot to pesticides in your life, you're going to get Parkinson's disease. We know that's not true. So what are the other determinants of that relationship? Well, gene environment interactions are likely to be very important. If you carry certain genetic variants and you are exposed to pesticides, maybe you've got a modest increased risk of Parkinson's disease. But if you carry different genetic variants and are exposed to pesticides, then your risk could double or triple as a result of that. So these gene environment interactions, gene gene interactions, environment environment interactions are likely to be very important um, at the individual uh, level for at developing Parkinson's. A brief bit about metals. Um, exposure to heavy metals can occur through diet, through manufacturing, uh, through occupational exposures. Uh, iron through dietary sources or circulating iron levels have been associated with PD in some epidemiological studies, a bit unconvincingly in, in my opinion, but iron chelation therapy or iron removing therapy from the body bodies under investigation as a, as a potential therapeutic strategy. The other metal that comes up in the literature is manganese, uh, where you can get exposure through welding so, or other steelwork, battery manufacturing, and also synthetic drug use, quite akin to the MPTP story. But when you do see Parkinsonism in the context of, of manganese exposure, it looks a little bit different to um, the Parkinson's disease we see in the movement disorders clinic, for example. So I'm not sure how important that is at a population level. Very topical right now is the link between uh, infectious diseases and risk of Parkinson's. Uh, we re I was recently fortunate to be involved in a, in a review article on this, where we summarized all the evidence for uh, viral links, bacterial links, and other infectious diseases links um, to the risk of Parkinson's. We'd previously studied this in the context of, of viral hepatitis and shown that people with hepatitis B and hepatitis C are at higher risk of getting uh, PD in the future. But I guess most interestingly right now, you know, our potential cases of Parkinson's disease occurring after coronavirus exposure or infection. Now, I have to say I'm a, I'm a bit skeptical about this. I've not seen anything convincing that suggests that you might get Parkinson's disease um, as an immediate or uh, indirect later consequence of coronavirus infection. But the last time we had a real uh, global pandemic was about 100 years ago uh, with the Spanish flu. And what followed the Spanish flu, flu over several years was an outbreak of, a, of an illness that bore some resemblance to Parkinson's disease called encephalitis lethargica. It was 
attributed um, to the Spanish flu and influenza at the time. But over time, the, the strength of evidence for the link between um, post-encephalitic Parkinson's or, or encephalitis lethargica and Spanish flu, flu have weakened and, and perhaps are, are weaker than ever now. So anyway, the only way we will know if coronavirus is linked to Parkinson's disease or other uh, diseases of the brain in the future is with long-term uh, follow-up studies. I don't think there's any cause for alarm uh, right now. Lifestyle factors are really interesting in the epidemiology of Parkinson's. Um, we first got interested in diabetes and Parkinson's uh, about a decade ago when we, we published this big systematic review uh, and meta-analysis looking at all the early features uh, and risk factors for Parkinson's disease. And diabetes was in there, um, was in there um, as one of the factors where we didn't see a significant uh, increase in risk of Parkinson's or a significant decrease in risk of Parkinson's. But actually, it was more interesting than that, um, we discovered over time, because actually, depending on the type of epidemiological study done, whether it's a, a design called a case control study or a design called a cohort study, actually, you see the opposite effects. And so a lot of our work over the last couple of years has been trying to unpick uh, why that might be. And I won't go into that. That's really a, a whole talk by itself. Um, but um, I'll summarize by saying that I do think there is an association between type 2 diabetes uh, and Parkinson's disease. And I think it is probably both a risk factor for Parkinson's disease, but also a driver of Parkinson's disease uh, progression. And the nicest example of this, um, of the latter, really came uh, a couple of years ago from Tom Folt and his group at UCL uh, with Dylan Athaldos, the first author in this Lancet paper, where they used an established diabetes drug, uh, exenatide, in patients with Parkinson's disease to show uh, that not only did it improve the motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease in those people that went on exenatide compared to the placebo arm, but that after the trial finishing and the washout period, and there was a prolonged washout period, those differences remained. And so this is the first signal potentially uh, of a disease modifying effect uh, for a drug uh, on Parkinson's disease. And I'll go on to explain why randomized controlled trials are the best example we have in epidemiology of how a certain risk factor or determinant is causally linked uh, to a disease like Parkinson's. But this was a great paper. What about obesity and body mass index? So this study showed that um, on average, body mass index tends to reduce over time in people that have uh, a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. This study looked to see if body mass index changes prior to a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease and ultimately found, concluded uh, that there was no evidence to suggest that. I will go on to say why I think uh, body mass index does change uh, prior to a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease and that I think that there may be a causal link there. But one of the other nice examples I have in this space is a study from Korea a couple of years ago that looked at both body mass index and diabetes, if you think back to the previous slide, and concluded a very neat interaction that showed that the, the highest risk of Parkinson's disease was in people with uh, low body mass index and diabetes. So an interaction there in low body mass index and diabetes, uh, a, a bigger magnitude of association for e than for either of those factors individually. The most well-known uh, negative association with risk of Parkinson's disease and so-called protective factor is uh, smoking. And this has been shown in tens and tens of, of studies um, but still, in my opinion, the jury's out as to whether this is truly a protective factor or whether um, this is driven by an alternative explanation. Um, one neat uh, piece of evidence in support of the former is that if you uh, consume nicotine, not in the form of cigarettes, but in edible forms, in the forms of bell peppers, potatoes, tomatoes, then risk of Parkinson's disease appears to be lower. But where nicotine has been tried in clinical trials, albeit not reported yet, my understanding is there's no evidence for a disease modifying effect. And I could keep talking about other potential protective factors for Parkinson's, caffeine, alcohol, Mediterranean diet, but just kind of going through all the uh, epidemiological literature in this way is probably a little bit dry. So I'm going to change focus a bit. The problem that I see with all of 
this investigation into the, uh, the risk factors of Parkinson's disease is that we have to start with a hypothesis. That's fine. Um, but how do you move on from it? So for all of these examples, it started with someone saying, um, hey, I wonder if viral hepatitis is associated with Parkinson's disease. If we find an appropriate data set, then we can do that analysis and, um, and give a conclusion, yes or no. But how do we move past that hypothesis-driven research? Well, in other areas of medicine and other areas of science, there's been a shift towards hypothesis-generating uh, research. And in hypothesis-generating research, what what you tend to do is throw a whole load of data at computer algorithms and see what pops out uh, from a very wide range of, of potential risk factors as being the potentially important ones. And then you focus on those important ones. And the neatest example of this really comes uh, from the genetics. Genetics of complex disease, but of course we're interested in Parkinson's, so the genetics of Parkinson's. So this is the latest uh, genome-wide association study or GWAS, of uh, Parkinson's disease, which was published by uh, Mike Knowles and the International Parkinson's Disease Genomics Consortium um, about 15 months ago. And I'm gonna stick on this a little bit because it's relevant to what we talk about next. So what you do in a genome-wide association study is you take literally thousands of unrelated uh, people with Parkinson's disease and thousands of controls and you compare those two groups to one another. It's a case control study. And the way you compare them is by tagging their genome at regular points across the genome with little markers and then comparing variation across the genome in Parkinson's disease cases uh, compared to controls. And you, you undertake a whole load of statistical comparison tests for thousands and thousands and thousands of markers across the genome. And the ones that pop out are the, are the so-called GWAS hits. And they may give you some clues about where in the genome there is potential genetic variation that might explain the Parkinson's, uh, Parkinson's disease or, or Parkinson's risk. And so what we have on this figure is the 22 chromosomes that make up your genome uh, along the horizontal axis. And each red and orange dot on here is a hit. OK, an area of the genome that is associated with being someone with Parkinson's disease. And in the boxes next to each of these red dots, the boxes with the text is the nearest gene uh, to that hit, uh, to that marker. And those genes may be an area um, of, of relevance to Parkinson's disease biology that we can then home in on and evaluate further. So this is um, hypothesis generating research about the, the biological basis of Parkinson's disease. Now, in order to do this type of research, I said you need many thousands of PD cases and many thousands of controls. So you need large consortia who uh, are very friendly and get on well with each other and want to um, understand complex disease as a collective. So this is the International Parkinson's Disease Genomics Consortium. It's been a tremendous privilege of mine uh, to be part of it over the last um, five years. It's a fantastic collaborative uh, group of people who have really driven much of the genetic discovery in Parkinson's disease over the last uh, 10 to 15 years. And this paper uh, from Cornelis Blandrup, Mike Niles and Andy Singleton shows how genome-wide association studies have expanded largely as a result of the IPDGC over the last um, 15 years or so. So the first Parkinson's disease GWAS had 250 patients, 250 controls, and no regions of the genome lit up. There were no hits at all. But this is now the latest one that we, uh, we did a couple of years ago. Nearly 40,000 patients, 1.4 million controls, identify 90 potentially relevant areas of the, of the genome. And just to say at this point, I think this is where epidemiology needs to move. This kind of hypothesis generating research, throw a load of data at the computer algorithm and say, okay, what sticks? What do we need to look at as novel environmental risk factors for Parkinson's disease? Now, what's really exciting uh, in the Parkinson's disease genetics space is a new project called the Global Parkinson's Genetics Programme, which has been funded by the Aligning Science Across Parkinson's 
um, uh, initiative and uh, with support from the Michael J. Fox Foundation. And this is a hugely ambitious project, which again, I'm very fortunate to be uh, part of, that will dramatically expand our understanding of the genetic risk factors for Parkinson's, make these globally relevant and accelerate and improve uh, the discovery of mutations that are relevant to Parkinson's disease. And I think what's really nice about this project is, you know, all of the studies really in complex disease have been done in populations of European ancestry, so Northern Europeans, North Americans. What GP2 aims to do is really get in uh, to the underrepresented parts of the world uh, where, we don't, where we know very little about the genetic basis of Parkinson's disease. Africa, Latin America, Asia, and not just gather samples from patients in those underrepresented regions, but train and support and empower clinicians and scientists in those regions to build research capacity in those regions. So it's not a case of, you know, all the samples go to North America for analysis. It's that the flow of information and training goes both ways. So this is a hugely ambitious project and, and, and will um, illuminate um, our understanding of of Parkinson's disease, in my opinion. But let's go back to epidemiology. So I've talked a little bit about how um, the findings from genome-wide association studies can be used. You see these hits in a genome-wide association study, and then people that do proper science, not me, zoom in and find out what are the causal uh, genes or causal pathways that might explain those hits. But what I use GWAS data for, what I use genome-wide association study data for, is to generate individual level risk scores and uh, for, a pro for, for causal inference to try and identify how things that are apparent environmental risk factors may truly uh, cause uh, Parkinson's disease and not simply be associated. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. I said that the genome-wide association studies gives us hits across the genome for an association with Parkinson's disease, and each of those hits is independent. So in an individual person, you can count up the number of hits that they have to create a polygenic risk score for that person. Now, those polygenic scores at an individual level are no good for prediction or diagnosis, although lots of um, online direct-to-consumer companies would have you believe so. They're not very good for that because there's a lot of overlap between PD cases and controls, and that's why you need very large numbers for GWAS studies. But where those polygenic risk scores are really useful for the kind of work that I do is they're very useful for examining interactions between genes and the environment, examining shared genetic architecture or shared genetic basis between two conditions, let's say Parkinson's and diabetes, potentially for personalized medicine, and for causal inference and, and, a, and a process called Mendelian randomization, which I'm going to tell you about. Limitations, as I say, not good for individual prediction or diagnosis. And um, really, as I've already mentioned, have to date had a very heavy focus on people of European ancestry and hopefully GP2 will, will revolutionize that. So causal inference, this is really trying to um, take a leap beyond what we do in epidemiology, where we say, ah, this risk factor is associated with uh, Parkinson's disease, but that association could be explained by very many things. So what, we, what we're trying to do with causal inference is try and identify whether that risk factor causally affects Parkinson's disease. So um, let me give you an example. Smoking would be a good one. Um, does smoking really protect you against Parkinson's disease or, is the nature of the relationship in the opposite direction, that something about Parkinson's disease before, it before it's diagnosed makes you less likely to smoke or makes it easier to stop smoking. That's the notion of reverse causation. Now, if that's the truth, then changing smoking behavior is not gonna have any effect on Parkinson's disease because the relationship is explained in the alternative direction. And the other explanation for associations in observational studies is that of confounding. That is that actually, the important relationship is not smoking and Parkinson's disease, it's another factor, which we may or may not know, that factor or those factors associate with both smoking and Parkinson's disease and explain that association. But again, intervening on smoking is not going to change anything about Parkinson's if it's explained by a third factor. Now, I mentioned the Xenotide trial um, and randomized control trials in general. The gold standard of all epidemiology 
is to be able to do a randomized controlled trial so you can truly test whether your risk factor or your intervention is causally linked to your disease of interest. And the reason the randomized control is so useful is because you allocate the intervention, you allocate the exposure or the intervention as part of the design, you give that to people, okay? And therefore it's not the disease changing it, you're giving it to people to change the disease. And the process of randomization, the process of randomly distributing people between the active treatment arm and the placebo arm evens out all the possible confounding factors. So when you see an effect, it's down to the treatment. It's not down to reverse causation, and it's not due to the confounding factors, it's due to the treatment. So why don't we just do loads of randomized controlled trials? Well, the first thing to say is that they're costly and time consuming. The second thing is that if you need to run them for a long time and wait for people to get a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease or for Parkinson's to progress, it can take a very long time as well. And also it's not ethical to randomize people to everything. You, you can't ethically randomize people to be exposed to pesticides, for example. You can't ethically randomize people to be exposed to, to start smoking. So we need to find an alternative. And again, this is where genetics and epidemiology uh, collide. And actually, um, they collide in this, in this area called Mendelian randomization that was actually proposed by a very smart chap in the Netherlands called Martin Katan, who wrote a letter to the Lancet uh, more than 25 years ago, or just about 25 years ago, I should say, where he happened on Mendelian randomization as, uh, as an important, potentially important um, way of uh, inferring causality between a potential risk factor and an outcome. And I'm going to paraphrase uh, what he said, but he was particularly interested in whether serum cholesterol and cancer had a causal relationship. And what he highlighted in his letter is that serum cholesterol levels seem to be lower in certain cancer patients. Now, is it that uh, low cholesterol causes cancer or is it something about cancer that causes low cholesterol? And even in studies that go back over time where they measure cholesterol a few years before cancer diagnosis, cholesterol was low. But is it that the, the cholesterol is driving cancer, the low cholesterol is driving cancer, or is it that the undiagnosed cancer is driving down cholesterol? And what he pointed out was that serum cholesterol, circulating cholesterol is in part genetically determined. So the common genetic variation that you inherit from your mother and father that's randomly allocated to you at birth, predicts a, a, a proportion of your circulating uh, cholesterol across your life course. And you can relate uh, genetic determinants of cholesterol to cancer to make a causal inference uh, of how cholesterol may affect cancer risk. And this was what he, uh, what later became Mendelian randomization using common genetic variation, which we know is associated with a particular risk factor or an exposure. And using that common genetic variation uh, in conjunction with our disease outcome of interest to make, a, to make a guess or a proxy or an estimate of how much that risk factor truly affects uh, the risk of disease. And we've done a lot of this when it comes to Parkinson's. So our first experience doing this was to create, to um, curate and use um, genetic markers from genome-wide association studies that predict a lifetime average uh, change in body mass index and using those genetic markers or those proxies to say, to estimate how a change in body mass index might affect risk of Parkinson's disease. So what we showed in this study was that a genetically predicted five point higher uh, body mass index was associated with a 20% reduction in Parkinson's disease risk. And so one of my personal belief is that BMI drops not as a consequence of undiagnosed Parkinson's, but actually is part of the, uh, the, the causal link in Parkinson's and low BMI predisposes people uh, to Parkinson's on average. We've used Mendelian randomization in lots of settings. We've used it to explore uh, the nature of the observational association between smoking and coffee and alcohol and urate. We've created a portal online where people can do their own Parkinson's disease Mendelian randomization studies. We've used Mendelian randomization to predict the outcome of, of randomized controlled trials for lipid lowering, for example, and a couple more recent examples too. 
to summarize the much bigger part of the talk, which is the epidemiology of Parkinson's, there's still uh, much to be understood about the causes and determinants of Parkinson's. Um, genetics really has occupied uh, the limelight and will continue to do so, uh, but genetics, or, genetics is also showing us ways to revitalize and reinvigorate epidemiology. And the interface between genetics and the environment is very important and a very exciting place uh, to be working uh, when it comes to understanding Parkinson's disease. I want to just uh, finish off by giving a quick update on Predict PD, or as I call it, epidemiology uh, in action. Um, so this is really the uh, cohort study that um, where all of this work is played out in uh, real time. Uh, it's been funded and supported by Parkinson's UK since the get-go. It was funded through an innovation grant I got from Parkinson's UK um, back in 2010. And I still uh, lead it to get today with Professor Net Schrag at UCL. Um, and what this is the homepage, so some of you will be familiar with the homepage. And I hope if you're not taking part, you will take part in the Predict PD study. What we did, um, or what we do, is we identify risk factors and early features from the published literature. And I've shown you lots of examples of that already today. Then we combine all those risk factors and early features in, a, in an algorithm that um, will generate a risk score, an individual level risk score, which we don't tell people, uh, but we use that to stratify people according to their future risk of Parkinson's disease. And then we follow people up over time. Now we ran this in a pilot format for uh, many uh, for many years, for kind of um, five years, where we recruited about 1300 people at baseline. This is the uh, spread of risk of Parkinson's in the general population. People take part via the website, they answer all the questions, they do the tapping task and the scratch and sniff smell test, and then we sort them out into higher, middle and lower risk groups and, and follow them up over time. And we've done a whole load of investigations uh, with the pilot cohort. For example, we showed that the higher risk group at baseline were more likely to have deficits in smell and finger tapping on the computer keyboard, so two important uh, potential markers of Parkinson's disease, that when we follow people up over a three-year period, people in the high risk group were more likely to be diagnosed with Parkinson's after three years of follow-up. Just to point out again, these are healthy older people in the general population, not people who already have a diagnosis. So we, we're creating this risk algorithm where we say, okay, we think this group is high risk and then waiting to see who does get Parkinson's to prove the validity of the algorithm. We also showed that people that are high compared to low risk have changes on brain scans that are relevant uh, to Parkinson's disease diagnostics. And then uh, more recently, we've done a lot of work on our algorithm. So we had a basic algorithm that um, uh, separated people into risk groups. Now we've done a lot of what spent really two years working on that algorithm to really tease out Parkinson's risk uh, a lot more so that the people who are lowest risk are now much lower risk uh, than they would have been in the old algorithm. And the people that are high risk are much higher risk than they would have been on the old algorithm. So we're really, um, really happy with this work that we've managed to do on the prediction algorithm. We saw people in their own homes uh, around the country when it was possible five years ago um, and showed that the high risk group had motor dysfunction, not sufficient to make a diagnosis of Parkinson's disease, but had subtle motor features um, that one would uh, could attribute to early Parkinson's disease when compared to the low risk group. And my um, and Christina Simonet, who works in my group, um, maybe some listeners will know she's traveled around the UK before coronavirus, seeing all of those people again, five, six years down the line and examine their movement again, their blink rate, handwriting, their walking. And what we're seeing is not only do high risk people by the predict PD algorithm um, have motor dysfunction at baseline, but they're more likely to um, acquire new motor features over five to six years. So some of them will be on a trajectory uh, to Parkinson's, which I think is interesting. And we've also applied uh, the PREDICT PD algorithm in different settings, in a cohort called the Brunick study in North Italy, also in the UK Biobank, and have uh, several collaborations in other parts of the world where we are using the PREDICT PD algorithm as well. So there is uh, there we've um, we've done a lot of research with the pilot cohort of Predict PD. We have been for the last two years 
um, expanding the PREDICT PD study from uh, about 1,000 people uh, up to uh, 10,000 people. We're currently at 7,500 people and we still need more. We've got a very robust plan for recruiting the remaining uh, few thousand by the middle of 2021. But of course, we're doing this now in the context of coronavirus. So we've had to shift our uh, the way we do things a little bit. Now, a major focus of the follow up of the 10,000 people is instead of face to face contact is through linkage to health records. So getting people's NHS number when they register and then linking it to their long term uh, NHS health records so we can find out who gets Parkinson's disease and other health outcomes using uh, remote means to collect blood biomarkers, saliva biomarkers, DNA from saliva, and much more work uh, on environmental risk factors. So at least for PREDICT PD, uh, the best is yet to come. And I hope you'll invite me back to update you in a, in a few more years. The last thing I want to do is acknowledge um, there are tens and tens of people who have uh, supported this work and my work and me uh, over the last uh, 10 years. So really too many uh, to list uh, by name, but you will know who they are and they knew, know who they are. But particularly I want to thank Parkinson's UK for their support of the PREDICT PD study over the last 10 years and the BART's charity for their support of my uh, work more generally over the past three years. And then the other organisations here who I think are also really uh, accelerating uh, work in this space. So thank you for listening. My contact details are there and I'm very happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was brilliant. It's really, really good. Um, I think it, it really stands out that uh, PREDICT PD was a, a study uh, well ahead of its time because it, it was, although there was some face-to-face -face element to it, so much of it was designed to be done remotely. So very, very much ahead of its time. Um, we've got a, a couple of questions have, have come up and hopefully uh, as people are uh, thinking of more, they can fire them into the, the, the Q&A box. But uh, if we start with a couple that are in there, um, do the risk factors, et cetera, apply equally to Lewy body dementia or is that a separate disorder from Parkinson's, do you think? No, I don't, I don't think it's a separate disorder. I think it's a highly um, related disorder. There may be, um, there are nuances in the parts of the brain that are affected with, with Parkinson's, what we recognize as Parkinson's being more, the pathology being, being more concentrated on, the, on the, the motor aspects of the, you know, the motor structure of the brain whereas Lewy body dementia being uh, more, of a, more of a cortical disease, but they exist on a spectrum. Um, and and should be considered such, you know, clinically when we see people, um, and also biologically. So I, th I think it's well recognised that Parkinson's, like you're saying, is a, a range of different things. Um, are the the data you're gathering giving you a sort of view of sort of stratification of people into different types? I so I think that's interesting. So I think the the studies where um, where you where you have a really good chance of separating people into different subtypes of Parkinson's disease are those where you've got large cohorts of people with a, with a diagnosis of Parkinson's already, like the tracking Parkinson's study and the discovery cohort. But just like there are different types of Parkinson's under that umbrella, I think there are different inroads into what later um, becomes Parkinson's. And so, you know, the and where we look at, um, I haven't talked about specific at-risk groups, I really talked about population risks, but if you look at people with um, unexplained smell loss, you look at people with REM sleep behavior disorder, you look at people that carry GBA mutations or LART2 variations, they have different features on the way in to Parkinson's disease. So that, that spectrum exists before diagnosis as well as after diagnosis. I mean, just to, just to answer the, 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 the actual question that person put, much less effort, much less work, and um, there is much less literature correspondingly on the risk factors um, that relate to Lewy body um, dementia. Um, but I'm sure a lot of them will be the same. Um, it's, it's partly, I think, due to the ascertainment of Lewy body dementia. You know, Parkinson's, even though there's that spectrum, um, 
we, we get it right about 85% of the time where we make a diagnosis, whereas much of the way that dementia is captured, diagnosed and coded, not in specialist centers, but more broadly, is, um, is not through accurate phenotyping. You know, it's someone gets a diagnosis of dementia, they don't necessarily get a, a, a diagnosis of, of Alzheimer's disease or Lewy body dementia. So that's a real problem for clinical practice and also for research. Yeah, because certainly for research, there's been a lot of discussion that things like GDNF might have been, GDNF might be um, successful early. And so clearly being able to detect Parkinson's early could be very, very useful for research purposes, even if not uh, immediately clinically relevant. Um, second question on the list, with regards to causal links, no mention has been made into the growing view that life stresses and life trauma is stored in cells and contributes to the outcome of diseases such as PD. And there's reference to the work of Dr. Gabor Mate. I don't know if you know no, that. No, I don't know that. I, I, I will certainly look it up. Um, so in terms of that, I believe, I haven't mentioned it, you're right. Um, the uh, It's quite hard to quantify life stress and life trauma. I mean, I haven't, um, I haven't talked about uh, much about dietary um, exposures to Parkinson's disease either because um, um, the uh, capturing those risk factors is very challenging. But the question, do I believe that life stress and life trauma plays a role in Parkinson's neurodegeneration more generally? Yes, I absolutely think so. There are great, um, there are great um, case reports or great examples uh, that we see um, in soldiers in World War II, World War I, um, who have um, features of Parkinsonism, or pe pe Parkinsonism or features of Parkinson's disease, who have just been through horrendous um, circumstances, victims of um, torture or war in other countries. Um, this is, I'm sure there is a link, um, but proving it epidemiologically is quite challenging. Fair enough. There's a, a few questions coming through along the lines of how do we participate in Predict PD? Um, so uh, www.predictpd.com. Can I put it in the? How do I put it in the? Well, we, we'll we'll send it out. We'll send an email to everybody who's attended, and we'll put the details there. And and I think Liz Nash has put it in the chat box as well. Great, predictpd.com. Thank you. And I think the key thing you're looking for is people without Parkinson's diagnosis, aged between sixty and eighty. And they can be anywhere in the world, or is it constrained to be in the UK? UK, ideally, because then it's you know we can link to NHS records, and if we do get chance to see people again, then we can see people easily. But um, uh, we, we we you know it's an online study, so anyone can really take part. But our inclusion criteria of people in the UK. Okay, um, and that sort of keys up uh, another question that always occurs to me. You, you described the advantage of getting a large amount of data and, and throwing that at the computer to get to, to generate hypothesis. And clearly a large amount of data from people with Parkinson's is helpful, but obviously people without Parkinson's are valid there too. Is there anything that people with, sort of, who supporters of Parkinson's research can do to help liberate information? Is it a, policy campaign or is it sort of tick box on NHS records that we can do to to make information more more widely available? Well I think um, um, so part of our the next phase of our recruitment is via GP practices where people will have had to check a box to say that they're happy to be contacted for research so where those opportunities come up in primary care I definitely support them um, the uh, Join Dementia's research platform is uh, is an important platform, not just for dementia, but for neurodegener neurodegenerative disease more uh, generally. So, um, you know, older people with and without neurological conditions can join that as a, to be a, to, to offer their services to research, um, which is which is obviously great. Um, yeah, so there are things you can do. Excellent. Um, another question. As my husband is the third successive generation in his family to be diagnosed with Parkinson's, are our two sons at higher than an average risk? And also, is, is there a research program they could be involved in? Um, so, so Parkinson's is relatively 
uh, common in at, at, uh, in older uh, in older people, as so I say, one in fifty or one in a hundred people. That's under that's diagnosed with Parkinson's. I suspect the actual the truth is actually slightly higher than that. Three successive generations is reasonably um, uh, is reasonably high. I would I would ask your your husband's neurologist um, about that. Um, in terms of studies that they might get involved with, they're probably they are probably too young for predict PD. Um, but they're I I don't know what the inclusion criteria for PD frontline is, but that's looking at the genetic basis of, of Parkinson's disease in the UK. Um, so, a question from Elizabeth. My impression is that you developed the risk factor score on the basis of previous research on associates of PD. Perhaps I misheard, but is your study also generating new risk factors that were not previously suspected? So, um, yes, our, our kind of portfolio of research is, um, in, but then we look to implement those in Predict PD. In, in Predict PD, we really just use things that are um, look like they will be useful from the published literature, from epidemiological studies more widely. Um, so we use the things the kind of known knowns in predict PD uh, to create risk scores but in our wider portfolio of research we, we, we want we are and we want to find um, new uh, new risk factors for Parkinson's. So another two questions that look sort of related uh, have you established a link between Parkinson's with gut health and nutritional deficiencies and and any sort of study done in terms of diet so diet nutrition gut health and, and can I just add, so Delina asked in the chat box about the, the what you mentioned about sourcing caffeine from red peppers and so on, that does that also hint at uh, nutritional connect connections? But, but potentially, I mean, um, I think, so just to cover that question, first of all, I think what that paper, um, independent of an action through the gut, what that paper about edible forms of nicotine adds is credence to the idea that smoking may contain something that's protective against Parkinson's um, uh, because there's that kind of, that, there's that um, consistency with, um, with nicotine there. So I think that's what that study shows us. In terms of the gut more generally, I mean, obviously this is a really hot topic uh, for uh, Parkinson's disease. It's, um, there are lots of studies on um, the gut microbiome um, that are ongoing right now on gut brain interactions. Of course, the gut and the brain are connected through the autonomic nervous system. We've, we've looked at it from an epidemiological perspective in the past where we, we published a paper several years ago showing that constipation occurs prior to Parkinson's and may actually occur 20 years prior to Parkinson's, and which adds a bit of credence to the fact that there could be a pathogen or a change that occurs in the gut um, and then spreads through the uh, through the autonomic nervous system, through the vagus nerve to the brain, where it eventually um, causes Parkinson's disease. Um, my unpopular view is that um, the I think that there's a bit of a pendulum swing with microbiome research in um, in uh, research into complex diseases in general, and I think the pendulum swung very much in there's a lot of interest in microbiome. I suspect it will swing back at some point in the future and it may have importance to Parkinson's, it may have importance to other diseases, but it's unlikely to be the whole story. Okay, and um, related to that, diet and exercise, does lifestyle changes, are they significant to PD progression? Oh, there's so many questions that that one is, um, so, so diet's really challenging. And the reason it's really challenging is because the tools to measure diet are either large and unwieldy questionnaires or they inadequately capture um, dietary patterns. I mean, if I think about my uh, diet, which is a balanced diet, if, you, if, you, if I answered a questionnaire in one week, it would be totally different to what I had the next week and totally different to what I had the next week. And it's just because of slightly chaotic lifestyle, even though the diet is balanced, the content of the diet varies so much over time. Um, so it's extremely challenging. Um, 
probably where gut studies might give you um, insights is it because it may they may actually give you a readout for what diet's been over a, pre, uh, a period of time. So there may be nice work that could be done there on correlating questionnaires with what's actually found in the in the stools of people. So bottom line, yes, there are studies of um, diet and Parkinson's disease risk implicating dairy products um, in the main, but um, they're those studies are heavily biased and the tools used to um, capture diets are flawed in lots of ways. Fair enough. A um, couple of questions about head injuries that somebody took a nasty bang in the head when sailing 20 years ago and Parkinson's became apparent 15 years ago. Any likelihood that those can be linked? Yeah, so head injury is really um, chicken and egg. I didn't go into the, um, I didn't go into my analogy for causal inference, but a, a, a head injury is a good example for causal inference because, um, uh, you know, is it the head injury that sets off a cascade that ultimately becomes Parkinson's disease, or is it subtle symptoms and signs of Parkinson's disease that predispose people to getting a head injury? You know, that someone has a fall because they've got Parkinson's disease is not diagnosed yet, it's very subtle, but they fall and have a head injury or they get uh, bopped on the head by something because their reaction time has slowed. Um, there, are, there are lots, well, there are several epidemiological studies that show a link between head injury and subsequent Parkinson's. And um, there are links from, uh, there are clear links from um, cohorts of sports persons boxers, rugby players, American footballs and the like, where people have um, uh, developed pathology and brain uh, damage over time. But the, what they get in the end isn't necessarily Parkinson's. The pathology is different and, it's a, and it's, a, it's a condition called CTE, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. So potential link, but the jury's out about what the direction of that link might be. Again, quite difficult to, to measure and these things are extremely challenging to, um, the, the, the extreme, the, they're extremely challenging to measure. And, um, you know, it's quite easy to do an analysis and write a paper about an association. It's quite hard to take that association to the next level and say, okay, but is there really something you can do about it? You know, do we really think it's causal? That's the challenge. Um, so another question, is there any connection between childhood viral illnesses and the onset of PD? So example, measles. Uh, yeah, so but, but, um, basically all, um, all common infectious diseases have been linked to Parkinson's at one point or another. It's just the consistency of that over, over you know, several studies. And the thing that pops up um, from my perspective uh, several times is hepatite, viral hepatitis um, uh, comes up quite consistently. The other one that comes up quite consistently is Helicobacter pylori, which is the bacteria that um, causes stomach ulcers as well. So again, maybe gut inflammation that, that contributes to Parkinson's disease. But me measles is not, um, not convincingly linked, although it has popped up in the odd epidemiological study. Un, un, um, measles is linked to a very serious brain condition, rarely called uh, subacute sclerosing panencephalitis, which is obviously very different to Parkinson's, but it's a very severe brain disease. So people should always be vaccinated against uh, measles. Um, so, a person here who's diagnosed with Parkinson's 18 months ago, since been diagnosed with lymphedema, is there a connection or is this just bad luck? Age 74. Um, it depends whether lymphedema is occurring. I suspect it is probably bad luck, but you know, if it's um, if it's in a in a leg or an arm that's on the more affected side, you know, we do depend on our skeletal muscle pump to return blood to the heart from the peripheries. And so, if a particular part of the body is moving less, uh, then that skeletal muscle pump's not working so well, and so fluid could pool in that area. I could see that, you know clinically as being um, plausible, but but probably just bad luck. I'm sorry about that. Uh, heavy metal exposure, including sort of mercury amalgam in dentistry. Any any studies looking at that? Small case, small case series um, in the past. I've not seen anything recently. This was a fear. I mean, it's something I've been asked about at um, 
Parkinson's UK events for the, for the last um, 10 years or so. Not, not convincingly, in my opinion. And the next one, talking about personality traits as a, as a marker for PD. So I guess that's related to uh, stresses and things as well. Is, is there a Parkinson's personality type? Yeah, it's fa it's really fascinating. I mean, that's the that is the main alternative hypothesis for why um, you see protective associations with uh, smoking and coffee and alcohol and those things. That this is that there that is actually a pre-diagnostic uh, personality type um, where perhaps you don't get the same reward from smoking and coffee and alcohol as people that don't have that personality type. I. I think on average, you know, I'm talking about not at the individual level, but on average, I think there's a bit of a Parkinson's personality type. It's one of the reasons why clinically I chose to work with patients with Parkinson's disease because um, in the main, it's a very pleasant group of people to work with. And, and that does seem to be a personality trait. Um, whereas not all groups of patients are that pleasant to work with. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I, I think there is, but it's curious and it's very hard to study. Um, yeah. Uh, so comment about, it sounds like eating bell peppers, tomatoes and potatoes can have a protective effect <laughs> than the linked pesticides. So does this point towards organic food or washing food before eating it? I think um, it, it really goes back to what you said um, at the beginning, Alan, which is um, none of this should be taken as um, medical advice. The stuff, the, the, most of the things that I've talked about, apart from, um, you know, the cluster of heroin users that um, had impure heroin with MPTP, which um, we would all know that's a bad idea. Um, but um, most of these things are studies that are done in very large numbers of people and probably don't apply at the individual level. So, um, you know, should, should if people, um, if a population just had organic um, bell peppers and tomatoes um, and potatoes and the like that were not, uh, not, got any pesticides leached into them, then yes, maybe you would have a few, you would have a fewer cases of Parkinson's disease, but at an individual level, it's not likely to have an effect. And um, what's we got here? GYS, are there any common molecular changes in genes causing on off switching of changes? I don't understand the question, but I hope. I mean, so it's a, it's a, it's a, um, it's a it's a it's a really it's really a, um, a, a kind of talk in itself the um, the interaction uh, between genes uh, individual genes for Parkinson's disease and uh, the the kind of combination effects of genes um, like I mentioned polygenic risk scores um, this is really complicated and the presence of genetic uh, uh, and there are lots of examples in Parkinson's disease, but the presence of genetic variation also doesn't necessarily mean that there is a, a downstream effect. There are still lots of things uh, that need to happen at the protein level, the translation of, of DNA to uh, proteins, and then uh, where the proteins actually uh, uh, interact and um, function. Um, so not all insight, not genetics is not the final answer. In fact, it's only the first step in understanding the biology, there's a whole lot that needs to follow downstream to actually understand what the pathways are. Some of that is done, but that's a much slower process than doing a GWAS study. Okay. Um, so, a couple more. Any link with Gulf War syndrome, 1991? Also links with TCEs. I'm not sure what TCEs are, but. Um, so, it's a, it's a good question. I haven't, I haven't ever looked at literature on go, Gulf War syndrome, but I'm sure there, there must be a literature on it. Um, so, so, so certainly the cases that I'm um, aware of, the case series that I'm aware of are actually from the First and Second World War. The other, the other kind of interesting group are other people that are under extreme pressure, like world leaders and politicians. There's quite a literature on world leaders developing features of Parkinson's, particularly while in office, that, um, that then often resolve afterwards. 
but they either they, they either do or they don't resolve. But transient Parkinsonian features in world leaders, so people who are under extreme stress, there's definitely there's definitely a link there, but it's it's hard to study. Yeah, I think Angela Merkel and Vladimir Putin and Donald Trump have all been sort of uh, labelled that way. Um, what else we got? I managed PD with no medication by diet, movement, and quality food supplements plus probiotics. I'm convinced there's a link between PD and nutri nutritional deficiencies. I think. Um, yeah, it, it well, it goes back to the diet thing. I mean, it is it is hard to study. It's fantastic that you can manage your Parkinson's like that. Most people at some point require medication, but if you are managing that, it's fantastic. That's brilliant. And is agnosia a cause or effect of PD? I'm fascinated by this question, Carol. Um, I'm fascinated by, I've, I've never, um, it's one of my aims to, uh, to try and study this as a research question, but I've never effectively formulated the research question. So um, the agnosia for people that don't know is a failure to recognize objects or faces or self um, I think that I think part of Parkinson's is a difficulty uh, or uh, a feature of Parkinson's is difficulty in recognizing self in epidemiological literature. What we see is that um, being unmarried is a risk factor for dementia. And so isolation and uh, lack of a network seems to be a risk factor for dementia. Whereas being married is a is a, is a. Um, Sorry, not being married is a risk factor for dementia, whereas being married is a risk factor for Parkinson's. And I think that's because spouses and partners spot the features of Parkinson's uh, before the patients do. And I think that also persists throughout, um, throughout Parkinson's disease. So people with Parkinson's that are very dyskinetic often don't notice that they're very dyskinetic or it doesn't bother them so much as it does their spouses and their partners and, and you know, their, their network. So I think that that, um, I think that that is a feature of Parkinson's. I think it persists from the very early stages uh, right the way through, but I've never been able to study it effectively, but it's fascinating. And just to be clear, you're not saying that being married is a source of stress and therefore a source of Um that, so it's a it's a very interesting subject. My my explanation is that partners notice the symptoms um, more than more than the patients do themselves. I think that, I'm sure that's true. Um, and it's interesting you mentioned about recognizing things because I'm fairly sure that around about the time I was diagnosed, I started recognizing people sort of based on people who looked similar to people I knew. I'd sort of done. I think I'd spotted somebody in a crowd who I knew because they, were, they looked similar to somebody I didn't know. So recognizing faces seem to go a bit south. That's, that's also fascinating. So some of our research right now is, um, we know that smell loss is a feature of Parkinson's disease early, although people often don't notice that they've lost their sense of smell. You have to test objectively. And we know great, really great work that Ramona Weil is doing at UCL on um, the visual changes that occur in Parkinson's. Um, uh, but interestingly, there's a literature on hearing loss in dementia, and we see signals of in, in our data that hearing loss may be an early feature of Parkinson's. I suspect all of these things are um, represent difficulty integrating sensory information. And so where people have lost their sense of smell, they often um, have phantosmia where they um, perceive smells that are not there. Uh, or perceive some smells as being unpleasant when in fact they're not unpleasant. I wonder if what you're saying, Alan, is that some of the visual changes that might happen in Parkinson's lead you to spot faces in crowds that are not actually familiar faces, they're just strangers. It's very interesting. So last question in the chat, are there any pesticides that contain MPP or related chemicals in use in the UK today? Well, very good question. I, I don't know, but I... Um, I'm interested to, uh, I'm interested in that. This is something I'm interested in right now. Um, I pulled out that day. I, I knew that Paracrat was banned in the UK, but it was only when I was preparing for this talk, I realized that we have a company in the UK that's still a major uh, producer of Paracrat and exporting it to other countries. So um, this, is a, this is something I'm interested in right now as a result. I think it's, some, it's something we can take action on that 
if it's appropriate, we'll send around the details of the Parkinson's UK campaign on, on that. I think uh, exporting paraquat is, uh, is a bad thing, something we could stop. Uh, a couple more. Um, single site tinnitus, is there a link with PD? I know I think Martin Taylor has talked about having a single site tinnitus. Interesting. I mean, <sighs> Yeah, I mean, there's a. I would. I was going to say that maybe is, is it the side that's most affected? Um, of course, there's a fifty-fifty chance of that being the case. I think that um, ch changes in changes in hearing are well established for um, for dementia. Um, and what a big umbrella term dementia is, you know. So, kind of nuance what I say there, but um, um, I'm sure there are hearing processes that go awry in Parkinson's disease and I'm sure um, some of those hearing processes contribute to speech changes in Parkinson's as well and, and self-monitoring of voice and we talked about self-monitoring but the the way that um, speech can um, go progressively lower in volume or the words can run into each other it's that self-pacing and those auditory cues that we get that are all likely to be contributing these pathways are extremely um, uh, complex. Okay, so the last question we'll take is, there seems to be such a connection between dementia and Parkinson's. Is it safe to assume if you find a cause and a cure for one, you can cure the other? No, I don't think so. I think that as we've touched on at, at various points, these are um, Parkinson's and dementia are umbrella terms for a wide spectrum of um, diseases and disorders that um, and in, at the individual level, there's going to be different contributing pathways. And I think there will not be a wonder drug for Parkinson's or dementia. It will be a case of um, incremental gains with those drugs and probably combinations of treatments that target the pathways in a, in a precise way. Um, but I do think there are reasons to be, um, there are reasons to be optimistic. I mean, the, the, um, I, I mean, I cannot overstate um, the level of investment that ASAP have put in to understanding the biology and um, genetic basis, not just the GP2 study, but the next phase of the PPMI study, and then very many funded projects understanding the biology of Parkinson's. There has never been a chance like this in history to, um, to uh, understand the pathways that are relevant to Parkinson's and intervene. It's really very exciting time uh, for Parkinson's disease research. Yeah, 